Welcome to Sneaker University, the one place where you can learn the entire process of sneaker design from scratch. Ten steps from thumbnail sketching, engineering, CAD development and rendering for presentation, outsole design and drafting, and spec and pattern construction drawing preparation for pullovers and prototype perfecting, and production sample confirmation, including every other step and stage in between. Learn from a pro. I'm Cyrus L. I perfected this process over the span of my career in the footwear industry with over 10 million pairs of kicks sold, hundreds of designs created and produced. I came into the industry as one of the top artists in the country and I learned to parlay my artistic ability into pure industrial design and engineering and quickly earned a name as a great designer working with endorsed athletes as the director of basketball and cross training at one of the major brands. And now, well established with my own brands, you can learn this lost process from the best in the industry. Let's go. Classes in session. Welcome back to Sneaker University. You're watching episode number three, CAD development. In this episode, I'm gonna show you how to take your final line drawing and import it into the computer for presentation. Episode number one, I explained it's the step-by-step -step process of generating a thumbnail, which is the soul of any sneaker design. Uh, episode number two, uh, we went over how to take that thumbnail and very carefully take all of the engineering considerations to uh, develop it into a final line drawing. Now your final line drawing, usually done in ink pen or pencil or whatever your preferred tool is, is what's needed at this stage in order to develop a CAD drawing. You take that uh, drawing and you very carefully import it into the computer. I'll explain to you my patented process, which I use Adobe Illustrator. Um, to do that, there's a couple of different ways that it can be done, but this way is very efficient and it sets you up uh, and allows you to uh, then generate in the next episode, number four, uh, your, ca your colorways um, out of these particular CADs. Um, so, you know, you'll need the CAD and those colorways in order to present for a date on the calendar or the schedule of all companies. Uh, there's a point where you have to present your concepts to the to the executives or to the company. It might be the sales team or the marketing team to be approved for the next stage, which is de developing prototypes. Um, and it used to be that you could do your presentation drawings by hand with handmade renderings or handmade presentation drawings. But today you have to know how to utilize the computer to present these CADs. Um, before we do that, let's take a quick stop into the production methods classroom where I'm going to introduce you to a couple more concepts, including what a last is, um, what are cutting dies used for the pattern and even some parts of the outsole. And also uh, we'll go over a couple of different types of seams uh, that can be made. A seam, of course, are where the panels on the upper uh, come together. There's a couple of different ways that that can actually happen. We'll go over a few more ideas. Let's jump into that first. Any serious sneaker designer needs to be thoroughly familiar with one component uh, of the production process, and that's the last. A last is defined by Wikipedia as a mechanical form shaped like a human foot. It's used by shoemakers in the manufacture and repair of shoes. Lasts typically come in pairs and have been made from various materials, including hardwoods, cast iron, and high density plastics. I would go on and say that a last is uh, also not always shaped exactly like a foot. You can use the last famously to manipulate the shape of your shoe so that it has a square toe, pointed toe, arm and toe, or pretty much any other type of manipulation that you want. Um, the last is essentially uh, a 
it, what makes the shape of the shoe and it, it defines the fit of the shoe so if you want to have a special wider fit or a more narrower fit that's all based around the last a lot of companies use existing lasts for certain classic patterns they may use one last or they may, may use various lasts but um when you're designing your shoe once you finish the final line you want to decide what is going to be the shape of your shoe and depending on whether or not you have an existing last for that, you can go out into the market and purchase a competitor sample uh, that has the shape that you like. And then you send that over to the factory and the factory can duplicate it. You want to send it in advance because, uh, you know, in order for your schedule to je- uh, dovetail together nicely in jail, um, you want to get the things that take longer done quickly. Uh, like the ordering of materials, which comes a little bit later, but the last is one of the first things that you need to order. When you send it over to them, they'll duplicate the last as close as they can to the existing shoe that you sent them. They'll send it back to you. You can compare and contrast uh, and see and make any adjustments that you need to get it perfect. Last come in uh, broken last and solid last because in the process of lasting the upper pattern uh, to make the shape, you, they last it around the last. Um, there's a machine that does it uh, and there's a machine that needs to take it out. Uh, sometimes in the earlier stage of the process, they'll, they'll take it off the machine and the last is still in there and a human has to take it out. You all have to take it out. Um, so the last comes broken, which is much easier to pull out a more uh, complex, longer or last that's harder to pull directly out. Uh, and then there are solid lasts that uh, you got to figure it out. So the last and the upper pattern have a special relationship. And that's because the last is where the upper gets its shape. When you are building your first prototypes of your sneaker, you're going to end up working with a place in the factory sample room called the pattern room. And the pattern room has a person inside called a, a pattern technician, usually one or two or a multitude of pattern technicians uh, who build what's called a pattern gauge. And the pattern gauge is uh, akin to the paper pattern that a tailor would use to build a pair of slacks or a blazer or seems just used to build a dress. Um, but it's used for building shoes, for building sneakers. Uh, so the pattern tech will use, uh, will draw a pattern gauge, which is a piece, uh, uh, you know, each piece of the shoe uh, drawn out flat on a white board. And then that pattern gauge is used to make cutting dies. Cutting dies are metal pieces made to match each of the panels on the pattern gauge. Uh, they're metal, uh, basically cookie cutters. They're designed just like cookie cutters, um, but in each of the shapes um, that are used to stamp through leather, mesh, foam, or any other material that's specified in the upper pattern. Um, and uh, pa- uh, cutting dies are actually used also in uh, cutting outsoles. There's a type of outsole called cut and buff EVA. Uh, traditionally, you'll see a lot of sandals and flip flops are used where they cut uh, with cutting dies, uh, sheet EVA. Uh, in the in the in the case of sneakers, uh, shoes like the Nike Cortez, they're popular uh, like late '70s and '80s style um, running shoes that are made with die cut EVA. Um, and in those cases, the uh, EVA is cut and then it's skived so that it's kind of tapered a little bit so that the midsole can fit to the upper. Um, so these cutting dies, these metal cutting dies are used in the outsole. They're mostly used on the upper. Once the pattern room um, cuts each of the panels for the shoe, then it allows the stitching line to assemble what's called a pullover. Um, and a pullover is the test pattern um, that precedes your actual prototype. Um, the pullover, origin- it starts off flat. Uh, um, aside from like the counter, which is slightly rounded, the rest of the pattern initially is flat. Um, the pattern line will then um, stitch together the vamp area, and then that's put over the top of the last, laced up, and then the last is used to fuse the shape. The machine actually that holds the last and applies the last to the upper, fuses the shape of the upper to the last. And, you know, in most patterns, there's materials built into the uppers that are uh, set with heat. Um, you know, different types of, you know, uh, materials that are used, especially in the vamp that actually holds the shape of the last, so when the last is pulled out, it's, it uh, remains in that particular shape. Um, the lasting machine also, um, after the upper is lasted, the outsole is added on. Many pullovers, when you get them initially, don't even have an outsole because the pullover precedes even the outsole's completion. 
Um, so a lot of times when you receive your first, second, or third round uh, pullover or prototype pullover, it'll still have the last inside of it. As you prepare to import your final line drawing into the computer to generate a CAD, I want to introduce you to three different types of seams that you can use. And this is because when you build your CAD, you want it to be as exact as possible. So you don't create any unnecessary confusion for the factory, any unwarranted confusion, unintended confusion when they're trying to build your sneaker. Uh, so aside from your normal seam, which is where two pieces, usually leather, but it could be mesh or any other materials used on sneakers, um, is stitched, uh, two pieces are stitched together with a single, double, or triple stitch line, and the, but the raw edge is showing. That's your normal seam. Um, one of the first of the three seams I want to introduce you to is the folded edge seam. And folded edge is very similar to a normal uh, seam, except for the edge, the raw edge is not showing. It's folded over in such a way and then stitched down that you can't see the raw edge. Next, you have the stitch and turn edge. And the stitch and turn edge looks like a folded edge, except you can't see the stitch line. And that's because it's done in such a way where the stitching is done on the inside and then the, the panel that sits on the top is folded over. Hence the words uh, stitch and turn um, so that you can't see the stitch line, but you can see a nice, clean, folded edge uh, instead. And then the last of the three is butt seam. Uh, butt seam is, a sim is also related to the stitch and turn. And the difference between it and the stitch and turn is there's no panel that's sitting on top. So you have kind of a neat edge with no stitching showing, um, but both panels are flush. Um, whereas a stitch and turn would not make any sense to have a stitch line because then it would just be a folded edge. Uh, the butt seams don't need to have stitch lines, but sometimes they do. They might have a single, a double, or a triple stitch line on both sides of the seam. Finally, I want to go back over some of the acronyms we were using on the last episode as we introduce you to the production methods, standard production methods from the sneaker industry. Um, we talked about PU, which is used on the upper and also in the midsole uh, as, in certain cases. And PU stands for polyurethane. Um, I also mentioned EVA, which is the standard for most midsoles and uh, which are compression molded. And EVA stands for ethyl vinyl acetate. Then we went over TPR, which I did say uh, on last episode is thermal plastic rubber uh, for fine mold patches. And then finally, you can you also use PVC uh, for different parts. It's kind of a rigid plastic, uh, can be used for stabilizers and eyelets and uh, other places, usually smaller molds. Um, and PVC stands for polyvinyl chloride. Uh, and then finally, since we're talking about plastic terms, there's a couple other ones I used the term last week. Um, and these are not acronyms, uh, including polypropylene um, and nylon. Nylon also uh, is 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 used, but those are used more rarely. So the purpose of this stage, uh, building your CAD, is to take your final line drawing and import it into the computer um, as precisely as you can, uh, because that's the point of building the CAD is to have everything precise. Your final line drawing is accurate in proportion, but now you wanna make it exactly precise. Um, and you wanna do that as quickly as possible. Um, whereas uh, back in the day, um, you could actually, when you, when you got to the point where you had your final line drawing and it was done, um, instead, rather than having the option to import it to the computer, you would take it and you would ink it very carefully with black uh, razor point pen or a series of uh, point tip pens. And you get that perfect black and white drawing and you don't add any other color. You try to, you know, maybe add whatever other details that are going to be there every time. There's always going to be stitch lines there. And you take that final inked drawing nice and clean and you make Xerox copies. And from there, you can begin to build colorways. Well, in this system, uh, the computer is far superior to that. A lot of designers, I suspect, um, take a final line drawing just like the, uh, the uh, inked uh, final that I just described, scan it into the computer and import it into Photoshop, clean up the lines a little bit, and then begin to manipulate their colorways using Photoshop. Uh, me, I'm not a fan of that because 
I think that you don't get the same amount of flexibility um, as you'll get from the process that I'm about to show you, um, which deals through Illustrator. Utilizing Illustrator, I use a process that essentially um, builds the shoe panel by panel. Uh, and very similar to the pattern technician uh, that's building a pattern gauge, the panels that I'm going to show you how to build are like the real panels from the panel gauge, uh, pattern gauge. And each panel overlaps in a certain way. The pattern panel that sits on the top truly sits on the top. And the one that sits underneath has a little flange. That little extra area of material that is uh, the area where the stitching can actually connect the two pieces together. Um, not only do I do, and that's very useful, I'll tell you why. You know, because when you go to color it, uh, in the, the next stage, when you begin to add your colorways, you can actually get a lot more accuracy in the edges of the uh, panels. First of all, you don't get gaps in between uh, where you see cracks. Uh, this is why I like to build the flange on the actual uh, CAD uh, drawing. Um, but also, if I decide I want to, to color a panel a certain color, you can treat the edge with the color as well. So if I'm building a red panel, I can give it a bur dark burgundy edge or a green panel, a dark green edge. Looks more realistic rather than just stand uh, like an arbitrary black edge. It just doesn't look as neat. If I'm making a white shoe, I don't want hard black edges. I might use a softened uh, gray edge. If I'm building, you know, if I have an all black shoe, I don't want to have black, be stuck with black edges. I might want to use a light, uh, you know, a charcoal gray that you can see the edges the way a shoe would actually look with the optics of your eyes, optically with your eyes. Additionally, as you're building the patterns with this system, um, you can actually uh, add a great layer of detail, like on this three peak drawing that we're going over here. Uh, you can see the way that I use these, these lines, like to to create a mesh. Those are horizontal lines created with cross hatching, uh, uh, you know, cross across each other, horizontal and vertical, um, with uh, dashed uh, a dashed line. And then you take them, you put them together, and then I can just uh, clipping mask you know, it clip and mask of them together. And then with the shape of the tongue and then place them on a the tongue, it looks like mesh. And I can change the mesh color similarly to the edge color so it always matches the mesh that I use on the tongue. And then finally, if I take a piece out of uh, this, this, this final CAD, like the tongue itself, then I pull it out. It doesn't look like some arbitrary puzzle piece to my CAD. It looks like a tongue because I built it like a tongue underneath. You know, similarly, the uh, the pull tab, every other panel, you know, you build, the, you think like a pattern technician, you build the whole uh, panel uh, in that part so that later on when you're coloring it, this is a much more, it's a better way to build the shoe. You can use it in your construction drawings, which I'll show you when we get to the spec stage. And, uh, you know, you can take advantage of all those different things. So next, let's, um, let's show you how that is actually done. You're watching Sneaker University, episode number three, CAD development, importing your final design into the computer. Let's go. One of the first things that I wanted, uh, you want to do is take your, uh, your final line drawing and scan it into the computer. Scan it. Don't take a photograph of a final line. Photographs always come out warped. You know, you, you, you want to, this is a... a practice of precision so a scan drawing is much more accurate scan it in drop her on your page make sure that that scan drawing is laying on your page at the same size that you want your final cat to be uh, really you don't have to worry about that too much uh, because when you're done you can still shrink your cat uh, your finished cat to the you know 80 percent or whatever 90 80 percent just don't make it too big because when you shrink it your your lines also shrink um, and you want your lines to be about one point so what I'm doing here is I'm starting off and I'm taking the, the, the lowest panel on the entire shoe is always going to be your inside lining on your tongue. The tongue actually sits behind every other panel on the shoe. Uh, that's the reason why you start with the tongue first. You start with the, the, low, the lowest level uh, panel and you build your way up. So on the tongue, uh, the, the, the part that sits at the very back of the tongue is the tongue lining. So here I started. I'm, you know, you see I'm laying the line with point and pass. You, you, you know, you learn how to use your anchor points quickly. 
and I laid a real quick lining out. If you look at that arch in the front of the tongue, that's because the lining actually doesn't trace, um, and in reality, the actual panel piece itself wouldn't trace the outside of the tongue. Um, it would actually be kind of warped because of the padding. And so I built it the same way. Here I'm building the next layer on the tongue, which would be the top layer of the tongue. I'm bringing it down, um, you know, down toward the toe. And as I actually set that point right at the eye stay, and this is a, uh, a U-throat eye stay, I wanna try to make sure that the tongue sits as close to realistic. If you scanned in with the X-ray machine and you looked at the tongue, uh, this being a disruptor too, by the way. I looked at the tongue of the disruptor under an uh, uh, X-ray, and I looked at the top panel, it would sit about the way that I'm drawing it, almost exact. You know, you know why build the whole tongue, Cyrus? You know, underneath the uh, the shoe because I want it to be uh, forever. It'll exist. It'll last. You know, how long does a cat last? Forever is the answer. And if I was going to last forever, why not take a second and build it as close to realistic as possible? So I just finished the uh, under layer of the um, tongue, the lining actually, and then the t uh, the top layer of the tongue so now i want to build this piece here uh this pool, pool tab piece um, so i use the technique that i've developed you can learn a lot of tricks on illustrator over the course of time and this is not a illustrator course this is for those that are actually somewhat proficient in illustrator i'm going to show you how to build how to use illustrator the way it's used to build a a, uh, a shoe cad based off of your final drawing engineered uh drawing so i'll take a um you know, I'll basically take a, a line that traces around the the, uh, the middle of this pull tab piece. I know it's made out of nylon webbing. And uh, then I'll take the edges and um, offset path, right? So I'll offset it maybe uh, a millimeter or something like that. And it gives me a nice thick. Then I delete that middle piece that it traced. So it gives me a nice even piece of nylon. Um, and I know it sits behind the, the layer, the leather uh, panel on the disruptor construction. So I build the nylon first and the layer, the leather next. The leather sits on top of the nylon webbing optically, and it also sits on top of the outer portion of the main tongue, actually. By the way, the disruptor um, tongue was derived from an early Grand Hill, uh, if you look, uh, Grand Hill uh, design that I created. Now I'm not talk, talking about the gondola, although the gondola has a similar, the gondola, gondola being a later version of the grant that I'm talking about. I believe this, my, the drawing, the, uh, the shoe that I'm referring to was a Grand Hill 2, it was a candidate for the Grand Hill 2. Um, the gondola used these patch overlays that sit on the tongue and they would have like a frame where the logo would sit inside of it like a window. The earlier version of it, this uh, Grand Hill that I'm referring to, I never named it, I don't think. Uh, it's, it was an unnamed, untitled Grand Hill 2. Uh, had a tongue that had like a, a leather patch that was built just like the Disruptor is. And it had like a, it's like a, we call it like a loop that went from the front of the tongue around to the back of the tongue on the Grand Hill version. It actually had some uh, cutouts as it looped around from the front to the back of the tongue that were, um, it, made, it was made to look like a crown. So anyway, the disruptor has that too. So now uh, I'm speed, this is a uh, time-lapse um, uh, footage of the, the rest of the disruptor being constructed that same way. The lining is the next piece. Uh, the eye stay is the next highest piece. Uh, there's an eye stay, eye stay uh, underlay or a quarter lay piece that sits next. And then the eye stay overlay, you know, the, um, the vamp is next. The toe cap uh, counter pieces, you see this little nylon pull tab sits uh, just below um, the, uh, that eye stay overlay piece. It's like a stripe that goes around from the front to the back. And I put the feel of flag, the underlay piece, then the overlay piece. Toe cap sits on top of all of that, actually. Uh, then you got the little nylon loop piece. Uh, eye stay, um, construction, these little eyelets, uh, U-shaped, U-shaped eyelets. 
I do a test every once in a while. You see me switch the pattern from uh, red outlines only to white and uh, white out, black outlines, white inside, just to see how things are lining up. Because I'm, I'm estimating what part sits on the front. I'm adding the laces here, and I'll put the counter. We're going to slow it down and show some of these steps a little closer. The midsole always sits under the outsole. Right, so I draw the midsole, then I draw the midsole detail lines, then including the logo, then I build the outsole. There's two in this CAD. This outsole actually has two pieces optically, the back and the front piece. Um, and every detail is kind of added on. Illustrator is perfect uh, for CAD and uh, sneakers because, it, I mean, every possible line that you would have to create, you can do it on Illustrator. If you notice on this toe cap, I did a, uh, and I'm going to go into the detail on this, I actually created a uh, cutout a piece uh, that looks just like the front bumper outline and I took it duplicated it set it out about uh, two three millimeters so that when I uh, trace out the on the toe cap uh, details I could use that to trace and make sure everything lines up nice so I'm switching it to white again here uh, white and black uh, just to see everything lines up the final things that you do when you're finishing is uh, make sure everything is layered properly make sure your lines are straight they look like they, they sit um, correct add your stitch lines right um, I pulled it out I'm testing it again oh I so you add your stitch lines and you do this on the, one of the final finishing touches touches that I do is I take the uh, outline very outer outermost outline I make it thick about five millimeters and I do that by uh, making a copy. I'll show you that in slow motion as well. Um, group it, um, put that uh, piece in the back, line it up perfectly, send it to the back. It gives you a nice thick outline. That's something I picked up from my graffiti art uh, days. It just makes it look robust uh, when it's presented. So here's a slowdown of that I stay work. Um, and again, the, the reason why I wanted to show you this part is this, um, you know, uh, 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 when you finish, as as I'm working, I've already built the inner lining. I've built the underlay portion of the uh, eye stay. Um, actually, I'm building these eyelets um, after I've already uh, drawn the overlay stripe that sits on top of the eyelet. So I have to, uh, I know that the way that I work, I know that I built them out of order. So I'm saying to myself, okay, I'm going to build these eye stays first. And once they're done, I'll group them. And I'll just take that stripe and bring it for, to the front so it'll sit on the top. And I, I know in my mind that the layers are in order. So when I switch everything to from red outlines to um, black and white, you know, black outlines, white inside, I know it's going to sit in the right order. Right. So now I just selected all of them. I'm probably going to select and group. I'm about to switch and do that test to white and black. And as I look, that stripe, sure enough, is sitting in the back. So I take it and I bring it to the front. Now it sits in the right order. Everything else looks pretty much okay. So I'm going to go back to red outlines and uh, no fill color. And that's kind of like the process that you can always do that as you get through the drawing because it could be confusing if you learn in the first time. Did I do the layers right? Is everything you, you go to switch it to white at the very end? If you wait to the very end and you're kind of novice at this, something will be missing. The whole flag will be, feel a flag will be missing. You're like, something's missing. And you don't know that feel a flag disappeared behind your lining. And right here, same thing on the toe cap. Um, this is fast forward to one of those steps. You know, I drew the lines. You know, the disruptor has those famous uh, raised portions on the toe cap. And I took a took one line on the top and then I duplicated it all the way down, setting each of the lines right at the edge of the toe bumper. And I went to the back and then stretched every other piece over. Made sure that they everything's lined up even. So now what I did is I separated just the, um, after I made that little guideline, see I made that guideline. Uh, took by taking the toe cap, duplicating or cutting the, duplicating it, then cutting the front bumper piece off, and then taking that front bumper piece to the exact same shape, and I've just moved it forward about what looks to me about optically three millimeters, um, actual size. If this was an actual shoe, and then I, um, then I take the actual outline of the outsole, and if you double click on it in Illustrator, it'll kind of separate it. So the only thing that'll be affected how you're working kind of separates it optically and work wise it will be that bright red panel that I'm working on which is the outline of the outsole and I go straight down in line and I you know use my scissors and I clip out um, each piece right where that uh right where those horizontal lines those textural lines meet 
And after I cut them with the scissors, then I can delete the parts that I don't want to be there, right? And then I know I can, um, once, you know, I'm trying to figure out now, hey, I could have, I wish I would have kept it uh, separated so I could only see and only affect those outline pieces. And in my mind, I'm probably saying, hey, you know what, another way I can do it is just uh, lock everything else. And then I go back and essentially I'm tracing uh, the missing pieces, but I can use that guide to trace them and, and make sure that they're sitting in the right place. So I take start from there, connect the, the point to point, connect it to there, All right? And I, it's a little bit off. I go down to the next one, pick up the point right there, connect it over. Seems a little bit meticulous, except for the fact that this CAD drawing will last forever. So I'm gonna take a little second and just get it, make it look neat. Connecting the points to the paths. Uh, actually, what I did with that guy line, I put it uh, inside of the toe cap. Um, it was sitting on the outside for a minute, so I got to this part. So I pushed it inside so I know how far I wanna bring my guideline, my outline actually in. And then that um, that piece that I saved, is the it shows me the exact shape that I need to land on. So. A lot of times I could even have taken that and I should have changed it to like pink so I could tell the difference between where that's at and where my red line is at. But I've done this millions of times, hundreds and hundreds of times. So for me, it's totally second nature. I can do this walking backwards, chewing gum. Um, so then finally, uh, this is the final drawing is done. So I want to see um, what it looks like white and black and what i'm doing is i'm taking my drawing out from the back so that that doesn't interfere with this final process i don't need that bad boy no more everything that i was on my final line drawing is now traced um in my cad but all i gotta do is now look at it white and black and i just eyeball it and make sure does it look accurate enough do i need to fix it once it's fixed um, and I skipped the stitch, adding the stitch lines on it. I think I, I think I showed that after this. Um, I take the entire finished CAD drawing and I delete the stitching. I'll delete any unnecessary inside components like the flag, because really this, this copy that I made of the shoe, I'm gonna use to make that thick outline I was telling you about. Um, so the thick outline, the only things I need to worry about is the outline itself. So any unnecessary internal parts I take off, take all the stitching off. I could take the logos off. I don't need them because they're going to, you know, I don't need the logo to have that thick outline. I take any uh, decorative lines off. I don't need them because when I take all of the outlines that are left over from the stripped down one, I don't want my outline to be disturbed by decorative lines that might poke out, you know, it just messes up the effect. Every single stitch line I go through and take it off. Do I need that back logo? You don't need it. Take it off. And take it off. Um, and once I know I got everything, every stitch line, every decorative line, uh, even on the, the uh, pull tab and on the tongue, I got these little decorative lines that I use to create like the edge effect. They're not, um, take all of those off, select everything, group it. Then I change the thickness of the outline to five. And then just so I know that all of these parts, the difference from the other parts, I change the inside color to charcoal gray usually. That's something that I like to do. Uh, so now it's nice and grouped. So if I click on one panel and get the whole thing, sometimes you want to throw this away at some point or on some CAD colorways. I take that piece and I line it up um, exactly. They call it on Illustrator, they call it uh, intersect. I think the word intersect comes up when it lines up perfectly. Try to intersect it with the other lower le level, uh, the original drawing. Once I know I got it just right, I'll let it go and then send it to the back. And then voila, you got a thick black outline, graffiti style. That's, that's from my illustrated or illustrator style, if you will. And then finally, uh, something else I was telling you about edges. You know, how you can treat an edge yeah, when you're really trying to give it that nice, neat look. Uh, so if this is a, my final line drawing, I sh actually, I shouldn't do this on the final. I don't have to do this on the final line drawing, uh, but I'm showing you this an example here. Since it's a white shoe, 
uh, I changed all the edges to gray. And actually what I'm doing right here is uh, I'm building a real quick black colorway. And I'm showing you how you can also take those edges. I uh, selected same color. That light gray edge obviously doesn't look natural on black. I'll switch it to a nice deep charcoal gray. So that way it's not black outlines. It's a deep charcoal gray outline. It looks better on a black CAD. It looks more professional to present that way. Those are the type of details you can do. I did that on this black one. You can also on white. Um, I like to use like an ash gray. All of the edges on a white shoe because when you look at a white shoe in real life, you don't have you don't see black edges. You see the edges kind of disappear almost to like a light ash, and it looks much better in the presentation. You can leave that thick black outline. You know, I like to leave the thick black outline on this so it jumps off the page. Um, but the inside line should be ash gray on white and on black, charcoal gray. And pop my logos back, you know, change them to white. Matter of fact, on a black fila, I think usually that corporate part of the logo is always, almost always all white. But I left it white with the red top on it. And that's it. That's how you do it. That's how it's done. Once you get that CAD, we're going to show you how dangerous a finished CAD. That's a nice polished one. All the details and everything is right. So in closing, I'm going to leave you with a little bit of wisdom. Since we're talking about CADs on this episode, uh, and CADs are used uh, for final presentations of your design, usually in, in front of the company, uh, whatever component of the company. Uh, this is now the industry standard. These basic uh, CADs, which mine has a little bit of extra on there to make sure that they're done well and you can use them later. Um, that's the industry standard. The standard used to be handmade uh, renderings and you really can't get away with that as much at this time. Um, usually uh, uh, companies like to see a good computer aided uh, design. But my caveat is for renderings, you know, overly rendered, overly processed uh, renderings when you're playing around with lighting and all kind of special material, hyper realistic material. You don't want to you don't need to spend that much time in the, the industry standard is the CAD format that I just showed you because um, you waste time. And a lot of times people do that in order to kind of hype up a design that's maybe a little underwhelming. It's better. You know, it's definitely a better uh, a, a practice to actually spend the time in making a great design. And when that prototype comes back, the design will speak for itself. And spending so much time rendering something that's probably needs it. Um, because at the end of the day, you let people down. You know, uh, you want to make sure your design is strong. You don't need to spend a tremendous amount of time doing this. You, you know, this, you know, stick to the standard and spend that extra energy on the quality of the design. Because remember, at the next level, you won't just be designing one shoe. You'll be designing collections. And you can't waste that much time on something that becomes trivial at the end of the day. So that's, those are my words of wisdom for this episode. Uh, see you all in two weeks as we get into uh, colorway developments. Peace. If you appreciate or enjoy the content that you found on the Sneaker University platform, be sure to subscribe, like, share, or even donate. We greatly appreciate it.